Um, firstly, thank you to Shirley for inviting us here today. Um, I just wanted to very quickly start with um, an anecdote, actually. I was in a, a barber's shop recently, and um, there was a young lad in the chair, who was probably about five or six, and the, the barber was chatting along to the lad, and he said, oh, we've had a good week at school this week, and the little boy nodded, and he said, uh, what's your favourite subject at school? And the little boy said, maths. And the barber turned to me and said, you know what, I've been asking every child the same question for years, and he said, these days, that's the most popular answer. And, and it just really got me thinking. I sat there as a, as a researcher of, uh, of uh, maths anxiety for a number of years. I sat there thinking, brilliant. That's, um, that's what we want to hear. And we hear lots of positive stories like that, which is absolutely great. But we're also fully aware that maths anxiety is still very much an issue. Um, amongst young children, from our own research, we know this appears at a, a very young age, um, possibly as young as um, four years of age. And it stems right through um, the, the various sectors of education and right through the workplace as well. And what I'd um, like to, to begin with, really, is um, a very basic model of, of maths anxiety. I think people are now very much aware of maths anxiety as a concept. Um, it still needs to be made more aware within um, the public's eye, um, and I think within um, maths educators as well. Um, but we do know certain things about it, and in particular the way it impacts on uh, maths performance. And here's a very straightforward vicious circle in a, in a way. This is very much um, um, quite basic in the sense that there are multiple factors that we could be added in here, but this is quite in intuitive. We're aware that maths anxiety impacts performance, first of all. We know that maths anxiety is very much related to negative attitudes, negative feelings. And quite clearly, poor performance is going to feed into that. It also feeds into the avoidance of math situations as well. So that might be the enrolment on, on maths courses. It might be involvement um, with, with parents, with homework, that kind of thing, which ultimately is going to impact on uh, preparation for assessments and, again, ultimately poor performance. So you can see quite clearly how that vicious um, cycle is maintained. What we're going to touch on today very briefly is a series of um, quite simple strategies that have been shown to be effective in the reduction of, of maths anxiety. And there's a common um, strand throughout these, which is a focus on the anxiety itself rather than um, the maths per se. Uh, so very much a focus on emotion regulation. We know from uh, a meta-analysis that certain non-psychological approaches aren't particularly effective. So these will include things like uh, class size, um, pace, um, and the use of specialised equipment as well. Um, I do note that as to add a, a caveat, this was conducted in 1990, and obviously um, technology has advanced um, considerably since then. So I'm, I'm a little bit unsure about that, that last one. But what we want to focus on are those psychological interventions. Um, and as I say, some, some are relatively straightforward. Um, I'll pass you on to David to, um, to talk through um, this first one. So this um, notion from a Spanish group was looking at uh, feedback. So this is basically in a very informal type of setting, uh, giving feedback about the sorts of errors that were being made uh, discussion of solutions. So basically, this, again, this is a way of enabling uh, the, the class and the students in the class to take control of their learning and to, um, basically, in this case, maths anxiety reduced and also the maths anxiety was no longer related to performance. So we're basically, and this, this approach breaks down the barrier between, sorry, the link between uh, maths anxiety and performance. And one of the things that they, they speculate on is, and, and obviously we've already heard this a little bit as well, is the importance of, of confidence here as well. This is a way of kind of providing and enabling confidence in those students, and that's again part of the driver, part of the buffer against um, anxiety and, and its effects. There's also a number of um, interventions that have taken writing approaches. And again, they're focused on kind of trying to regulate emotions. I mean, these are kind of fairly well... Um, known within a psychological literature, um, approaches that are, again, as Tom mentioned, very straightforward. They're not that tricky to do. Um, so things like um, writing down your worries, writing down your fears, we know helps to control anxiety. 
particularly just before you're um, faced with that fear, with that anxiety-provoking situation. Um, so, for example, um, the Chicago group, um, um, led by Sean uh, Bielok, basically asked people to write down um, their worries just before they did a maths test. And what, we've, what they found was that those individuals who are highly maths anxious and who had been performing most poorly, their anxiety levels went down and their performance improved. Indeed, actually, the amount of anxiety-related words that they wrote down was related to better performance. So those people who, who fully engaged with that approach basically had better performance. We've also had a look at this as well um, with, uh, within, uh, with our own students. Um, we looked at the most uh, mass anxious students uh, in the top 25% in terms of the measures we were looking at uh, and assigned them randomly to two conditions, either writing about an upcoming test um, and again, writing about their worries and their fears, or in this case, writing about the room they're in. It was a fairly boring room. It's not like, it <laughs> wasn't particularly exciting. Um, but then we asked everyone to complete a, um, a, a simple maths test. At the end of this, we also asked them to complete a questionnaire about the cognitive intrusions that they had. So this is basically about the worries that were springing to their minds um, as they were doing the test. Like the uh, BLOC study, we also found that people who did the expressive writing performed better when it came to doing the test compared to those people who didn't do the expressive writing. But what we also noted was there were differences in intrusive thoughts as well. And this kind of corroborates some of the work we'd done before. So we early, before, we had noted that those people who'd had high levels of intrusive thoughts basically performed worse on the maths tests. We saw that here as well. Indeed, not only that, we saw that those people who were in the expressive writing condition had fewer, express, uh, fewer intrusive thoughts. They worried um, less about those thoughts, and they found it um, easier to remove those thoughts. And this is one of the things, again, as we found was a particularly uh, um, strong replication of what we'd found, been found, we'd found previously was actually that how much people worried about those thoughts, um, and they some, it was, and it's some, quite a lot of those thoughts were basically the sorts of things we've already heard about, about I'm not good enough, I'm gonna fail, this is terrible. They weren't, they, most of the time they weren't, I wonder what's for tea. So it's not like these are trivial thoughts that people are having, they were actually about the actual thing and uh, the problems and that they were strongly related to their performance. Another, um, again, relatively straightforward approach um, has been reappraisal. So this is essentially looking at um, a person's uh, reinterpretation of a given situation. Um, there's an example here by um, Jameson and colleagues in 2016, um, where participants were faced with an, an anxiety-evoking task but some were told that anxious feelings were actually beneficial to their performance, whereas others were told nothing at all. And they found that individuals um, who had reappraised the anxiety uh, as being beneficial, first of all, um, performed better than those in the control group and also had lower maths evaluation anxiety. So again, a relatively straightforward concept that is producing quite dramatic uh, results. One way in which um, this can be interpreted is through uh, challenge or threat. And this kind of links quite nicely, actually, with what um, a, a colleague was, was talking about previously. And um, this notion of approaching a situation in a challenging way and really just changing um, a, an individual's mindset. We've got an ongoing project, um, this time with university students. So it'll be interesting to see what the results of this um, show. Very basically, uh, we have framed a set of instructions either in a challenging way or a threatening way. Um, this is actually with um, degree level math students, because again, we see even maths anxiety at that level. As I say, this is something that appears at any level, really, um, of education. 
and we framed the, the challenge and instructions in quite a positive way to get um, students really um, motivated and thinking positively about the upcoming task. Whereas the threatening approach is obviously the reverse to that. Um, and there's a control condition as well there's, where there's simply no instructions. So um, hopefully we'll have the, the results of that soon. We have done um, other uh, work as well around this notion of reappraisal. Because one way of approaching reappraisal is to think about not necessarily a task as being a challenge, but to think of um, yourself in a kind of safe environment. And again, this kind of ties in nicely with what the, the children in the video were talking about, this kind of safe um, classroom. What we did here, though, was with um, high and low anxious students, again, at, at university level. And we simply ask them to identify um, a safe place. So this is somewhere where they feel safe and relaxed. And we asked them to, uh, for 20 seconds to close their eyes and to just imagine themselves um, in that safe place. And again, the results were quite dramatic. We found, first of all, um, an increase, higher performance among the uh, reappraisal group, and also a reduction in the state anxiety that was uh, self-reported. So again, a relatively straightforward notion that's produced um, really quite interesting and dramatic results. So there's other approaches that, um, that are, again, straightforward to implement, very easy to do. So for example, focused breathing approaches. Um, these are often based on and, and used within kind of mindfulness interventions as well, where we ask people to think about their posture, um, the focus of their attention, and also to kind of um, make sure that they're breathing in kind of a diaphragmatic kind of way as well. Um, again, when we ask people to do these sorts of uh, techniques, um, they tend to perform better um, after, the, after they um, use the techniques. And then um, with, a, with a school children, we've taken a similar approach. Well, one of the things that, so, and um, we've used breathing within a systematic desensitization approach. In this case, we've asked, we've taught children the breathing technique. We've, gone, we've got them to go away and practice that without necessarily doing any maths. And then as they do maths that's more and more difficult, to use the breathing technique to help to calm themselves down. One of the things that we were slightly surprised with this intervention in uh, secondary schools is, um, and, and younger children is how readily the children just did it. So in the same way that we've seen in the video, actually, you know, the, the children basically take hold of these ideas and you know, we end up learning from them in terms of how easy it is to kind of implement these sorts of things and how readily they'll, they'll share it with their friends and they'll encourage each other to do it as well. Um, so one of the things to say about this as well is that also we found, you know, we found this is you know, particularly true for um, you know, those, in, those individuals with, with very high levels of maths anxiety. Um, so, Tom. <laughs> yeah, just to, to really add there, um, we wanted to mention some um, results from one of our former PhD students who uh, did an electroencephalogram study, an EEG study, looking at neurological responses to um, digits or, or letters. And it was quite interesting in that he began with a series of um, multiple digits, um, just simply presented on screen, and wanted to see um, essentially brain activity in response to those um, as a function of anxiety level. And he ultimately, over a series of experiments, reduced the stimuli down to single digits and was able to find um, differential brain activity as a function of anxiety level in response to just single digits on screen. So that was really um, interesting alone, I think, um, to emphasize the way in which people can respond uh, and the way their brain responds to simple um, numerical information. So even not doing very much maths at all, even just looking at numbers, if you're anxious about the numbers themselves, basically leads to rather different responses. And as we mentioned as well, that's what we were finding with um, um, from focus groups of very young children, four and five year olds, that actually, you know, they've not done very much maths. It's not like they're doing very complex sums, but actually they're talking about their negative experiences of doing maths even at those sorts of ages. And just to kind of um, expand on this idea of um, what is it people are thinking about, 
uh, when it comes to maths. One approach that's been known to be successful is cognitive restructuring. Um, so this idea of modifying cognitions and beliefs, so self-beliefs, about one's own um, ability and, and confidence when it comes to maths. And part of this will be to look at one's own success, for example, in maths. So someone might turn around and say, well, I'm, I'm not very good at maths. I'm just not a, a math person. I'm, not, I'm, I'm no good. Whereas actually, if you were to, to delve a little bit deeper and try and unpack those self-beliefs, you might well find that actually they've done very well when it's come to, um, to um, maths maybe within school. Part of this would also be the elimination of certain myths as well, um, and some of these are listed here. So the myth that, for example, boys are, are better than girls, or maths is, is more of a, a male domain. That high creativity is um, equal to, to being poor at maths. Or that some people are simply bad at maths, or might even be born bad at maths. Um, and also that maths has no um, utility, no relevance to uh, real life. And uh, just coming towards the end, this again ties in with uh, the notion of mathematical resilience, which is um, something that, that Sue Johnston Wilder and colleagues have, have been uh, developing. And I think ties in quite nicely with um, some of the maths anxiety work that's um, been going on. Um, and this broadly ties in with um, really trying to think about one's own mindset when it comes to maths, first of all. So um, looking at, as, as a teacher in the video was, was alluding to, this idea of actually what is a challenge? What am I comfortable with? What do I already know? But also which aspects of maths might create an anxiety response? So which bits in between can I identify as something that is a genuine challenge and something that I feel comfortable with um, and able to challenge myself with? But it's also um, tied in with this notion of cognitive restructuring as well. So increasing the relevance of maths um, and helping understand, um, individuals, whether they're children or adults, understand the importance of maths to real life. And this also ties in with things like de-emphasizing speed of calculation. There was a, a, a PhD student of ours recently conducted a study with very young children, a, a qualitative study. And this was definitely a theme that came out of their research. Um, this notion of speed of processing within the classroom really creates um, a lot of anxiety and tension from a very young age. A big, a big part of this as well is um, an emphasis on making mistakes as being part of learning. Um, that this is not something to, um, to be concerned about necessarily, but this actually um, helps students as part of their, their learning journey. That it isn't ultimately the end goal, um, whilst that might be important, the actual processes involved along the way can really help an individual learn. Um, so it's about, again, creating that safe environment um, for people to um, understand their own mistakes. And this might be why, for example, the formative feedback um, approach is so helpful. So that kind of informal approach of looking at maybe where you've gone wrong with a particular problem um, and with colleagues or peers, trying to identify um, and understand those errors and, and, and understand better the potential solutions as well. Part of this um, approach of, of reduction in maths anxiety and increase in resilience um, is to allow a little bit more flexibility as well, I think, um, in, in terms of problem solving strategies. So again, as, as was alluded to within the videos, um, there are individual differences in the way that people approach mathematical problems. Um, and I think sometimes um, individuals feel very frustrated and quite anxious if they're told that they've got to use a particular strategy. So this is, again, something I think um, could be quite important. One general theme that's, I think, run throughout um, a lot of our research has been working memory and the impact on anxiety on working memory as well. So um, anything that can be done within the classroom in particular to free up working memory space will help in terms of reducing anxiety and ultimately increasing maths resilience. So in terms of next steps, as I say, we know maths anxiety is still an issue. We know certain interventions work, but at the same time, those interventions have largely been tested outside of the UK. We've started to make some headway within the UK, but we really need some resources, I guess, um, in, in terms of validating those interventions 
um, across the UK in different educational settings uh, with students from different backgrounds, um, different socioeconomic groups, different types of schools, different age groups and so on. Um, and this is something that can be done um, relatively cheaply as well. So we've, we've calculated for a cost of around £15,000, for example, we could conduct some intervention studies across, say, two, three or four schools um, and produce some quite um, interesting work. We would also like to look at the combination of those interventions as well. Um, and I've recently un undertook some work with um, Derby Council in terms of um, some action research. So trying to allow teachers to pick and choose those strategies, to, to tweak those strategies, to combine them as necessary, um, and to use them as they see fit really with their students within that given context. What we also need to know a little bit more about is the long-term effectiveness of those strategies as well. So many of these um, are shown to be effective at that moment in time, which is absolutely great, but we don't really know the full extent of, of how long um, those benefits last for. One thing that's touched upon as well, I think, within the, the previous presentations, which we're starting to look at a little bit more, is maths anxiety within teachers themselves. Um, and also math teaching anxiety, which is subtly different to, to maths anxiety. I just wanted to very quickly um, touch upon those, those two things. Baylock's work has shown, for example, that teachers' maths anxiety predicts pupils' maths achievement. They found no relationship between those two things at the start of a school year. By the end of the school year, there was a relationship. So it appears that in some way, the teacher's maths anxiety is influencing the pupil's performance. But importantly, this was found to be mediated or explained by girls' gender beliefs about maths. Their argument is that there's a stereotype threat um, involvement there. Um, but in some way, these things are, are intertwined. The notion of um, gender beliefs about maths, the teacher's maths anxiety, and the pupil, pupil's own self-beliefs as well. So there's still a lot of work that, that needs to go on there. There was another interesting story, actually quite a recent one, um, Mitsala et al, who used anonymous descriptions of pupils. And these anonymous descriptions varied only by gender. So some mentioned a boy, some mentioned a girl. And they found that the high maths anxious teachers predicted worse maths performance among the girls, even though those descriptions only varied by gender, which is obviously quite worrying. So there's a lot of work that needs to um, go on there, I think. Um, there's a lot of potentially quite subtle effects and lots of variables that combine in some way to ultimately impact um, children's anxiety and, um, and ultimately performance. And as I mentioned as well, it's not just maths anxiety in teachers that's the factor. It might be their anxiety around the teaching of maths. Um, and I, I undertook some pilot work recently, um, which was done across the UK. There's around 200 primary school teachers. And we basically found a very clear link between experience and anxiety, um, whereby the newer teachers were much more maths teaching anxious. They weren't necessarily more maths anxious, they were more maths teaching anxious. And that particularly related to concerns about pupils' performance. So it wasn't necessarily about the teaching of maths, but how that teaching of maths relates to outcomes, uh, which I think is a really interesting starting point. And as I say, the next step really is to understand that a little bit more and ultimately try and reduce, for example, um, the volume of, of teachers who are leaving within the first few years of, of work. So um, we know a lot about maths anxiety in terms of interventions and what appears to work. We also know a little bit about maths anxiety within teachers, but there's a long way to go. Um, and I think particularly within the UK, within this particular educational context, it's really important that we do more work um, to, to understand those things. And obviously the other part to that is, of course, we're really grateful that the Maths Anxiety Trust are, you know, are driving you know, education of the general public to these sorts of findings. Thanks. <laughs>